Hello, ladies and gentlemen, vibrant young Africans. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're joining this webinar from. How are we doing today? Um, personally, I feel excited because the weekend is here. Um, while we wait for others to join the call, let me know how you feel. So in one word, describe how you're feeling this day. Um, so I'll just go into the chat box to see our comments. How are you feeling today? Okay, I can see good, somewhat, <laughs> okay. Yeah, um, Marlene Oluchi says, thank God it's Friday. Justin says, grateful. Ah, oh, I'm grateful too. Um, Sal Mata says, I'm excited to be here. Ibuka says, I feel exquisite. Mm, I like that. Ah, yeah, bonjour, Olimata. Okay, I'm feeling fabulously. Maintaining beauty over here. Girl, I see you. Okay, exhausted. Um, Lucky says, he's exhausted. Sorry about that. Um, Cheeto says, good to be here. Daniel, I greet you too. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So we would give others, um, say, two minutes to join, and then we'll start this conversation. Thank you. Okay, so it's six minutes past 11. I am joining in from Nigeria and I'm super excited to be here. My name is Rachel Okoronko. I am a monitoring and evaluation professional and a young female leader with the Amazon Leadership Initiative. And I will be your moderator for today. So I will be moderating this session, this webinar or panel session titled AU Reforms and Youth Engagement. Yeah, just to note for our participants who are French speaking, you could just um, click on the, on the icon there to switch to the French conversation. Yeah, so like I said, um, the webinar is titled AU Reforms and Youth Engagement. Um, it will interest you to know that this session promises to be insightful, to be engaging. I mean, we have the privilege of listening, I will be hearing from extinct experts who would bring in a wealth of knowledge, experiences, and diverse perspective to this table. So I have introduced myself and it will be glad to meet all of you. So please quickly tell me your name and where you're joining us from. So you could just say your name and maybe your organization and where you're joining this call from. Okay. Thank you for mentioning that, Mobin. All right. Um, I can't see any comments coming in. Can we all hear me? Okay, yes, yeah, so I can see um Anadu Ebuka. He works with Erti. 
Empowerment and Rights Initiative at Bonnie State. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's keep the introductions coming. Bulimata from Senegal, good to see you. Watara Yaya from Ghana. Um, I can see Alex Festus from Heart Initiative Nigeria. There's Liz Lindsay Johnson with Cloney Foundation, good to see you. Amadou Salmata, good to see you. Ray, it's good to have you on the call. Alexandra, Anita, Graham. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Let's keep the introduction coming. Yeah, I can also see a giraffe with chefs. Nice to have all of you on the call. So while we keep the introductions coming, um, we would go on to set some housekeeping rules. So the first would be that you should keep your microphone muted at all times, mm -hmm. unless you've been authorized to speak. And then another is that please ensure that you utilize the chat box or the Q&A feature to ask your questions or to share insights. Then another housekeeping rule would be that you treat every participant with respect and professionalism. So refrain from using disruptive behavior, refrain from using offensive language or inappropriate content. Then I would like to also remind us to remain attentive and engage throughout the webinar so that you maximize your learning experience. And then finally, your feedback is really valuable to us. So throughout the conversation, please feel free to share your highlights or key takeaways on various social media platforms. Um, I'm sure that our social media um, personnel would put on the you would put out the hashtags that we'll be using to promote our conversations across various social media platforms. So please ensure that you adhere to this housekeeping rules, you know, to enable us have a productive and enjoyable conversation. Thank you so much for your cooperation. Yeah, so please keep the introductions coming. I would like to meet each and every one of you. Now, we would go on to, you know, set the agenda for this conversation. Um, like you all know, it's a panel session. Um, so the first would be that we would lay the ground for the conversation. So we are going to listen to our distinguished panelists as they provide insights and perspectives to the topic at hand. Then after that, we would go on to open the floor to interactive discussions. You know, you could share reflections from the conversation and you could also go on to ask questions. So would invite the panelists and would invite the panelists to, you know, throw lights on any of the questions that would be asked. Mm -hmm. And then after that, we would now conclude our session by reflecting on insights gained. We're going to identify actionable key takeaways. And then we're also going to explore avenues for future collaboration. So with that being said, I would like to encourage all of us to, you know, actively engage, share your thoughts. If you're yet to have breakfast, please grab a cup of coffee, um, put together your writing materials, and let's get started. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our extinct panelists, and then we would embark on this journey. So the first panelist I will be introducing is Ms. Divine Karim Yamulamba. Divine is a dynamic 27-year-old young female leader hailing from the vibrant Democratic Republic of the Congo. She wears multiple hats with finesse, from being a dedicated researcher, a compelling author, and an inspiring French lecturer to a visionary entrepreneur, a Christian podcaster, and a compassionate philanthropist. She serves as the stakeholder and engagement associate at the Amazon Leadership Initiative, the Ali, an acclaimed women-led organization driving impact, impactful change through mentorship, leadership training, and gender empowerment. Good morning, Divine. It's good to have you on the call. 
It's a privilege to be here, Rachel. Thank you so much for the warm introduction. Thank you, Dubai. Now, the next panelist I would introduce is Ms. Mayi Aman. Mayi is a lawyer and a human rights activist. She currently works as a legal officer at the Initiative for Strategic Litigation in Africa, ISLA. Her work focuses on strengthening regional accountability mechanisms. She is also pursuing a doctorate degree in human rights at the University of Pretoria. Hi, Mei. Good morning. It's good to have you here. Natural. Happy to be here. Thank you. I love your hairstyle. Is that your natural hair? Yeah, yeah. I just had a haircut recently, so... Oh, wow. It looks lovely. <laughs> it's good to see you. Yes. And then finally, we have Justin Chidozie. Justin is a writer, a feminist, and an inclusion advocate from Nigeria. As CHEF's co-executive director, he leads programs and advocacy for LGBTQI rights and inclusion within West Africa and globally. After joining CHEF, before joining CHEF's rather, Justin led programs, advocacy, and communication work across diverse African organizations working on gender justice, education, HIV and AIDS, and SPHR. He is primarily skilled in philanthropic advocacy and wow. movement building for a just society. Wow, it's good to see you, Justin. Welcome to the call. Thank you so much, Rachel, for that introduction. Happy to jump You're on. Welcome. You're welcome. So yeah, um, I would like to say a very big thank you to our panelists for making our time to be here. And I look forward to an insightful conversation with you. So moving on, um, just the background, since we are all Africans in this call, um, the AU started making changes in 2017 to improve how it works. And then one big part of this change is to make the human rights system in Africa better. So there were concerns around, you know, young people, CSOs not being involved in the entire process. But I think the question or the concern should be how many young people are aware of the work the AU is doing and what brought about the AU reforms. So to start this conversation, um, Mayi, please, could you tell us what the AU reforms are? you know, give us a background into this conversation. Thank you. Um, all right, thank you so much, Rachel. Yeah, so basically, just like you said, um, the reforms, the current reform process that we were, we're going to discuss today started in two, 2017. Uh, but before we dive into the current reform process, it might be useful that to mention that there have been several attempts to reform the African Union in the past. Um, so as we know that uh, the African Union, previously the Organization of African Unity was established in 1963. Um, and part of the reasons why it was established was to promote unity, defend sovereignty, eradicate colonialism, uh, foster international cooperation and many other reasons. But uh, by the end of 1970, there was a consensus amongst um, African states that there was a need to re-examine the provisions of the African Charter and the, Afri on the, on the Charter of the, Af of the Organization of African Unity. Um, and that is was in light of the change in realities you know, of Africa. Most countries gained their independence at the time. So there was a need to revisit the Charter as well as revisit the, the organization's mandate, um, broadly speaking. As a result of this, in the year 2000, the Organization of African Unity underwent significant change, uh, significant reforms that eventually led to the adoption of the African Union as we know it today. So, but however, by 2007, um, it was kind of clear that the AU uh, requires substantial reforms um, to fulfill its mandates and, and um, objectives effectively. Um, as such, a high-level panel was convened at the time um, 
to evaluate the structure and functions of the African Union Commission and to improve the African Commission's effectiveness in carrying out its mandates. Um, so this kind of like just gives a picture that this is not the first reform when it comes to the African Union. Um, it's a continuation of a series of reforms that started years and years back. Um, the current AU reforms, like you've mentioned, started in 2017. Um, and it started when African governments, through the Assembly of Head of States, decided there was a need, um, an urgent need to kind of um, review the, um, the organs of the African Union, review their mandates, the, the functions, um, and this process was led by President Paul uh, Kagame, uh, President of Rwanda, um, and he was tasked by the African Union to conduct a review of the African Union and develop a report. Um, and this report was pub published in 2017. Um, it was called the Imperative to Strengthen Our Union, but it's kind of known to everyone else as the Kagame Report, yeah? And in this report, it presented five areas of reform to the African Union. These included first, streamlining the African Union priorities to focus on four core areas. The first was peace and security, political affairs, economic integration, and Africa's global representation. The uh, second area of reform was to realign the African Union institutions to effectively address these priorities, the priorities that I just mentioned. Um, the third core area was to connect, uh, for the AU to connect, reconnect with the African citizens. The fourth core area was to manage the African Union effectively at both political and operational level, also in terms of finance. Um, the, the fifth and last area that was identified was that the African Union should be financed independently and sufficiently from within the African Union, as in the African governments, yeah, to kind of move away from foreign funds and foreign aid to the African Union. Um, so yeah, that was the um, that was basically the areas that were identified in the Kagame report. Um, the process started in 2017, and I'm pretty sure a lot of us did not know about this process. Um, they're only hearing about it now, even though it started many years back. Um, but um, I think it's also important to just kind of highlight the current status of the AU reforms. So since 2017, the significant focus when it comes to the AU reforms concentrated on the structure of the African Union Commission, um, as well as some of the working methods of the AU policy organs such as the summit of the AU, coordination of coordination meetings with regional economic uh, communities. But not much has been done when it comes to the normative basis or the composition powers, mandates of the African human rights mechanisms, for example, uh, the proper segregation of powers, uh, which eventually would kind of enable the African Union to function effectively and efficiently. So the current phase uh, of the African Union reforms concerns the review and update of mandates of structure and structures of key organs within the AU. Um, and these include basically first the judicial organs, the legal and human rights bodies, which include the African Commission on Human People's Rights, the African Court on Human People's Rights, the African Committee of Experts on the Rights and Welfare of the Child, um, the AU Commission on International Law, as well as the AU Advisory Board on Corruption. Um, so this is the first cluster. The second one is the Pan-African Parliament. Um, the third one is the Peace and Security Council. And the third and the fourth is the Specialized Technical Committees. Um, and this current phase at which the, it, it's very important for us as civil society organizations to kind of to engage at this stage because um, that's the, the the AU reforms currently focuses on the African human rights mechanisms and it involves changes to the African human rights bodies of the continent. Yeah, these are key institutions at which African citizens um, as right holders engage with. 
Um, and we use these mechanisms, right, to kind of pursue justice, to pursue peace and security and accountability of member states. So it's very important for us to kind of really engage at this stage and not allow the process to continue with kind of uh, with the with the same lack of engagement that has been ongoing since 2017. Um, yeah, so this is basically um, kind of like a an introduction of what the AU reforms are. Um, Rachel, if you'll allow me, I can continue to the second point, which is on the implications of the African Union reforms. Yes, okay. please, me. Okay, so to provide more clarity on the AU reforms, it covers a wide area, right, uh, of the work of the African Union and the organs um, within, the, within the Union. But I think um, what concerns us the most as civil society organizations is the reforms that will affect the African human rights mechanisms, the accountability mechanisms on the continent. So when it comes to the reforms that are proposed, and mind you, it's still proposed, um, so kind of we really need to engage at this point. It's still proposals that are, that are made. There are three main proposals uh, when it comes to the reforms of the African human rights mechanisms. The first option or the first proposal is to enhance the current framework. Um, and under this option, the focus is to fine tune the current African human rights system, uh, preserving its mission and mandate. Uh, under this proposal, we recognize that the system uh, is unique in its ability to reflect African values and address range of human rights issues. So basically, this is the first uh, option. The implication of this option, um, it, it does not really suggest any major structural changes to the human rights mechanisms. Um, and this is likely to be the more or the most progressive proposal available since most of the key civil society organizations, key civil society proposals for strengthening the mechanism uh, focuses on fine tuning and strengthening the mechanisms that we currently have, identifying the issues that we're facing uh, with, our, with, our organ, uh, with our mechanisms and then kind of working on strengthening them. This is the first proposal. The second proposal is to merge the human rights bodies. Um, under, this, under this option, there is a proposal of merger between the African Commission on Human People's Rights and the African Committee of Experts on the Rights and Welfare of the Child into one entity. The implication would be that the rationale behind this proposal is to simplify the human rights mechanism, yeah? But as we are trying to simplify the, after the human rights mechanism or to enhance the cooperation or even optimize the resources, um, the, I, I would say a very clear uh, implication of this would be that um, it would lead to loss of specialized focus and when it comes to the mandates that the African human rights mechanism currently hold, um, especially when it comes to, for example, children's rights issues, which are dealt with under the uh, African Committee of Experts on the Rights and Welfare, uh, on the rights and welfare where you know, I'm speaking so loud, uh, typically. <laughs> uh, yeah, especially when it comes to children's rights, which are currently dealt with under the Committee of Experts on the Rights and Welfare of the Child. Um, so this is also something that we need to put in mind when it comes to the merger, that we'll definitely lose specialized focus. There's going to be a lot of bureaucratic challenges, as well as conflicting priorities amongst the mechanisms if we go forward with the merger option. The third option, is, which is a clear division of responsibilities between the mechanisms, uh, um, and under this what uh, under this mechanism under this proposal, um, it will involve kind of clarifying the mandates, the referral mechanism between the three mechanisms that we have on the continent. Um, it will also kind of touch on clarifying complementarity between the three mechanisms in terms of operation, the reporting, and improved communication among the three mechanisms. But it might seem great, but when it comes to the protection mandate, um, as we know, we have a protection mandate under the African Commission, 
we have protection mandate under the African uh, Committee of Experts, and we have protection mandate under the African Court, meaning that African citizens are able to take up cases before these mechanisms, communications before these mechanisms. So under this uh, proposal, it will involve removing the protection mandate of the African Committee of Experts and the African Commission, um, and basically adding all the cases to, to the African court. So the African court would be the only mechanism on the continent with the power to kind of um, hear cases and commu receive communications from African citizens. Um, the African Commission and the African Committee of Experts will only retain their um, kind of like promotion mandate, promotional mandate. They can take up visits to African states, promoting human rights issues, focusing on producing reports, et cetera, but they will not be able to kind of receive communications. Uh, and this is concerning because as the situation currently stands, there's a lot of difficulties in approaching the African court. Um, with cases, there is a lot of African states needs to put up forward a declaration that allows civil society organization and citizens to approach the court. And I'm not quite sure the current number that we have, but I'm pretty, like, I think it's around um, four states or so, and states are kind of withdrawing the declarations. So basically, if this proposal goes forward, then African citizens will have no place actually to take up case to take up cases against states and hold them accountable for Africa for um, for violating human rights. Um, so kind of like in a nutshell, this is kind of the the proposals that are on the table. And in uh, in June in June of last year, uh, the proposal of merger was kind of rejected by states. Um, it was presented by consultants um, that are working on developing the, the reforms report. It, uh, they were told to go back, think of other options and come and present them to the states. But so far, um, the documents that are kind of articulating the other various options for consideration, um, they're not really available to the public. So we really don't know, uh, but as far as we we can tell that uh, the merger option is still able. Um, yeah, so basically this is the kind of implications that we need to think of when we when we discuss the African Union reforms and the implication of the Afri on the African human rights system. Uh, and just before I end here, um, and I know that this is something that my other colleagues on the panel will be discussing. Uh, one of the major gaps in the reforms process since it started is the lack of proper consultation with civil society organizations, with activists, with youth, um, even when it comes to the CSOs that have been so far kind of thought to engage in the reforms process, um, their international human rights organizations, many of them are represented by men. Uh, there, there is obvious a lack of feminist voices in the process, youth pro youth voices in the process, um, national and grassroots organizations, climate justice access, and many, many more stakeholders that would bring different, you know, point of views to the reforms process. Um, I'll stop here um, and then we can take it up later. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mei, for that overview. I mean, um, I just knew that, I just knew about the changes, the reforms and all of that, but not so much in-depth um, knowledge about it. I like that you, you know, you highlighted it, you described the entire process, you, ex you explained the implications of the three proposals that have been presented. And then you also went on to, you know, mention the gaps. So this will bring me to, or this will take us rather to our next conversation. Um, you highlighted that there are gaps and these gaps are that, you know, young people, CSOs, these are key stakeholders who should be involved in the process of these reforms, and they are not there. So yes, um, Ms. Divine, I think this is where you would come in. And um, could you please, you know, tell us possible avenues for youth engagement? Like, how do you think young people, young people really should get involved or get engaged in the process? 
Thank you so much for your question, Rachel. Before getting to the how, I think it's it's very important to first lay the foundation on what the problem is and to what extent the problem um, has been uh, posing hindrances on the active participation of youth. So I'd like to start off by saying that um, a critical enabler of Agenda 2063 of the African Union is African citizens themselves. Um, however, since the reforms process inception um, in 2017, we have seen that um, there are lots of establishments that are being done without direct involvement um, of everyday citizens. So there's this struggle to create a concrete and accessible way um, for independent civil society groups to be able to contribute significantly in the affairs of the African Union. So civil society continues to face various challenges, um, such as not not being able to understand the process of how to contribute to continental policy discussions, how to obtain accreditation to even attend um, these meetings, maybe not even knowing annual schedules of um, the AU and all of those things. And as a result of that, um, there's just further limitations when it comes to uh, the opportunities that civil society groups and everyday citizens can really offer in terms of effective engagement. So because of this lack of commitment to connect with African citizens, there is also little in the reform process that reflects intentionality towards the youth who also happen to fall uh, under the civil society group. So we can therefore argue, right, that when civil society is not actively included, then by default, it's unlikely that the youth will also be included. And by actively included, uh, I'm gonna talk about this much later in my speech, but by actively included, I'm not just referring to side inputs, right? But the kind of active participation that can establish formal mechanisms that are able to shift discussions about the reform from events to policy spaces where resolutions can actually be enacted. So you might be asking yourself, okay, Divine, but where is where in the reform process do we see um, a disconnect in the inter intentionality towards Africa's youth? And I will only use one example, which was already um, stated by mine, and that is the reform proposal on the removal of the protective mandate of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, in short, the ACHPR. Um, so if this proposal goes forward, um, civil society will not be able to recourse to the ACHPR if their national mechanisms prove inadequate in safeguarding their rights. And for me, mandating individuals to solely seek redress from the African court, particularly um, when accessibility to it is already a challenge, represents a step backward towards the protection of human rights. Now, what impact does this have on the youth? Many young people in Africa struggle with human rights issues, uh, whether it's in, with relation to safety, education, employment, et cetera, freedom of speech, the list goes on. And the ACHPR has been vital in addressing these problems, but limiting access to it would firstly reduce options for the for the youth to seek justice, right? Especially those who come from disadvantaged backgrounds, um, their inability to use it effectively will increase. So if we feel our rights as young people aren't protected by national systems, um, and we also struggle to access regional justice due to complex procedures, it could further deteriorate our trust in the legal system and um, and discourage us from engaging in the overall societal changes process. And you know how it goes. There's this assumption that young people are not interested um, in politics and what goes on around them. But truthfully, it's because there are so many hindrances that just discourage us from even participating um, in the first place. I'm just going to try and speak slowly. And like a bad domino effect, um, you think empowerment will continue to be undermined, leading to the hindering of Africa's agenda, of Africa's 2063 agenda goals. So the question now is, the question that you asked, um, Rachel, what is the antidote? What is the solution for this disconnect between the reform process and the interest of Africa's youth? Um, and my answer to you would be, we need a youth-driven AU reform process, one that prioritizes 
active youth participation. A youth-driven AU reform process has a better chance at project projecting substantial change or impact over our continent than one that is oblivious to our needs, to our voices, to our leadership capacities um, for, young, for young people. And why is that? Well, first and foremost, statistically speaking, before we go into the deep epistemological reasons of our continent's population, is below the age of 35. So making us the fastest growing and the youngest population in the world. With that statement alone, it, it would be almost illogical to make decisions that will eventually have an impact on the majority without the involvement of the majority. So our inclusion in reform discussions ensures that the AU's actions reflect the concerns and the aspirations of a large segment of society. Who is that? That's us. So among the multiple challenges that the reform has manifested since 2017, and my colleague has already um, stated one of them being um, the lack of strategic focus on implementation, for me, what is just as dangerous or what I find twice as dangerous is um, the lack of intentionality when it comes to consistently creating an AU that is fit for the purpose of its citizens, especially those who are below the age of 35. So beyond the rhetoric, what then would a youth-led um, or inclusive reform agenda look like? Yes, it's important to acknowledge that the AU has recognized Africa's youth um, as the continent's most valuable capital in a couple of ways. So the youth has been included in major initiatives such as silencing the guns, uh, the adoption of the African Youth Charter in 2006, the 2009 to the 2018 decade of the youth, a cohort of young people from across the continent uh, that were appointed in various positions, the appointment of Aya Shebi as the AU's first ever um, diplomat to represent youth issues the same year, in 2018. And even in 2019, we had the 1 uh, million by uh, 2021 initiative. However, on an organizational level, um, even though these continental frameworks on youth are notable efforts by the AU, there's minimal implementation outcomes. And these implementation outcomes reveal um, that the youth does not receive adequate space and resources to participate um, in policymaking, to participate in policy implementation, and to participate in um, accountability mechanisms. I will use the 2018 appointment of the first youth envoy um, as an example the first youth envoy being Ms. Aya Shebi. So I'm just trying to see if um, there are any messages. Okay. All right, I will slow down a bit. So I'm just gonna take it up because of the sake of time. Um, I'm going to start with the example of uh, the appointment of the first youth envoy who happens to be Ayashebi in 2018. So we'll take it from there. So we notice here that she began her duties with no physical office or dedicated funding. So the first 12 months of her two-year term was spent assembling a staff, including those who were not even in Addis, right? And she had to delve into so many fundraising campaigns. And this goes to show that committing to the youth is more than just the placement of young leaders in the AU system. Supporting active youth participation within the AU goes hand in hand with the allocation of human and financial resources in order to sustain the agenda. So, we cannot separate the two because young leaders and their programs need resources to carry out their functions properly. I hope I'm slow enough for the translation. Um, I'd like to add as well that 
active youth participation doesn't end at appointing and financing young leaders either. So to avoid this rather tokenistic approach for supporting the youth, the AU can strengthen meaningful inclusion and engagement of the youth by institutionalizing their participation and leadership at both the high level and the institutional level. How can this be done? Firstly, by allowing youth representatives to participate and not just observe official AU technical meetings, official AU summits, official AU ministerial meetings. This will allow young people to shape the AU agenda, as well as the quality of the discussions in these high-level meetings. Another organizational um, example of this lack of support of active um, youth participation is when we look at the 2018 AU high-level committee investigation that happened, which confirmed allegations of sexual harassment at the AU High Commission. The investigation found um, that those vulnerable to such exploitation were female short-term staff, were female interns and volunteers. So such news forces us to see that active involvement of youth goes beyond just providing them with employment opportunities. It's more than just giving young people jobs in the AU through the AU Youth Volunteer Corps. Right, so supporting active youth participation, it necessitates a conscious consideration of the gender dynamics um, concerning the safeguarding of these young volunteers who often endure exploitation. And this is predominantly among women, right? So it's not just about appointing young people in leadership positions within the AU, but protecting them for and resourcing them in order to sustain the youth agenda. So I have mentioned quite a number of organizational challenges, uh, Rachel, uh, in the AU with regards to youth participation. But on the continental side, while steps have been taken by many African governments to tackle the immediate needs of young people through education and training programs, um, there are still issues such as underemployment that still pose a challenge for creating concrete change. Take the example of underemployment, for instance. There are many African young people that have jobs, but these jobs are mediocre jobs. They have very poor job security and low pay, especially in countries where informal economies are prevalent. So rather than seeing young people only as targets and beneficiaries of training and coaching and mentorship, active youth participation would imply giving them the space to meaningfully contribute to the topics that affect them. That's one. But two, and this is my favorite, equipping them with the factors of production that they require to create their own wealth and employment opportunities. So to end, Rachel, I will just say that in order for young individuals to derive meaningful benefits from the African Union reform process, it's very important to reconsider the meaning of youth, the meaning of participation. And I'll explain myself. So the term youth and participation are not synonyms for lazy, are not synonym for charity case, are not synonym for idol. No, we're not called to simply accompany decision makers by sharing our thoughts long after the, the, the decisions have already been made, right? So we're not called to just come when everything has already been packed and now it's affecting us, right? We are not monuments, we are change makers. Right, we're more than just um, 
invitees that are requested to come and do poetry for opening ceremonies. No, we have something to offer. We have something to bring to the table. And, and it is time for that paradigm within which the AU is talked about to move away from this um, assumption that the youth is a disaster, the youth is in need of saving. It's also time to look at the youth as solution finders for our continent, solution finders that can turn things around for the better. So the reform process must allow youth voices to reach the policy organs of the AU. For Agenda 2063 to come to life, we need to push for advocacy efforts that align with the interests of the youth, not just their immediate needs. And with that, I say thank you. Back to you, Ray. Thank you so much, Divine, for that insightful presentation. Wow. We are not sidekicks. We are change makers. I mean, if we are not, you know, giving a chance or a seat at the table, we have to drag any chair at all and be on the table. Thank you so much, Divine, for highlighting all of that. Um, youths have to get intentional to being involved in the AU reforms. Uh, so we'll quickly go on to the third question for Justin. Um, stemming from all of these conversations we've had for May and Divine, what strategies can African youth explore for sustained awareness movements and for movements building on the issue? Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you so much, May and Divine. I, I don't do well with closing. I don't climax well. So you'd have given this to Divine. <laughs> she has like really great climax. And how do you go after that? So thank you so much um, for that insight. And um, I just wanted to say that and re echo some of the things that Divine had said that as young people, we are in fact the solution. And since we make up majority of the um, African future and the African people, it's it's only it's only like ethical to let us drive the change, to let us drive these reforms for the future. So I'm just going to go ahead without much ado to point out some of the ways that we can begin to engage young people more within this reform and not just the African Union reform. We're also talking about like sub-regional mechanisms as well, like the ECOWAS systems, like the East African systems and the Southern African systems. These are places that often neglect young people. We are talking about young people involvement now because there is a reform in the AU. So all of this why we're just tinkering and just moving forward and we have people who are 50 years plus answering youth positions or leading youth positions or sitting in youth positions within these mechanisms. So um, May has gone ahead to tell us the implications and I think she was trying to put it lighter in order not to scare anyone, but it is very scary because imagine a situation, most of us here, we walk around abortion rights, walk around them, um, freedom of association, we walk around LGBTQI issues, we walk around um, um, climate, we walk around indigenous rights. And the African Commission on Human and People's Rights is more accessible, is the place that is often very accessible and open to receiving civil society organization. And we know how inaccessible, like Divine alluded, that the African court is. And merging all of these things together, we know the problem of, like uh, May said, losing areas of specialization, and there's going to be conflicting interests when there is no areas of specialization. Whoever sits in those positions are the ones who get who determine what issues should um, come to bear, what issues should be given um, legitimacy. And then we have the conversation around admissibility of complaints. And <laughs> so first of all, I feel like it's really scary, especially for organizations fighting for human rights. You should be concerned about what, what is happening in the African Union and not just, it's not just another government structure or government reform. It would affect the level of human rights across all African countries. Because if your government approve this or are sent to these reforms and um, civil society is not duly consulted, we know, um, the characteristics of government always to fall blind eyes to issues. Governments are not really people-centered, I just have to say that. So it's civil societies that are mostly calling the attentions of the government to look this way or to look at these issues. 
right? So I'm just going to quickly state that Firstly, I think the first thing to do, it is, it is long overdue, is to have a youth advisory board at the African Commission. This is what I feel very convinced in my heart, that if the African Commission or African Union has a youth sounding board made up of young people from diverse background, identities, diverse countries within the um, Africa, African continent, this would not just act as... Um, another activist advisory committee. This is young people who are skilled in diplomacy, who understand human rights, and who understand the implications of the future. The United Nations is currently talking about the summit of the future, where the, uh, um, the future of the world is going to, for the next 10 years, what is going to be prioritized globally as regards, and why it's also important to engage in the, the summit of the future, detects what issues, uh, we might say it doesn't concern us, but it also detects what issues funders are going to look at funding. So if issues or your issues do not make it to the um, um, agreed conclusion around the summit of the future and all of this mechanism, you also see that funders follow the trend around this area. Philanthropy follows this trend and government policies also follow this trend. So it is important that we are able to find ways to fit ourselves into all of this conversation. Even if it's sometimes me, it means bringing you a folded chair. If you don't have a permanent one, bring a folded one and sit after you pack your seat and you go. So all of this conversation is why I think both the UN and the African Commission, the African Union especially used to, needs to have a youth sounding board, like establishing a youth sounding board that advises the commission on things that affect young people and also, um, um, punching on the issues about young people making larger numbers of African population, right? No other continent in the world has the number of young people like Africa. And in the next five years, majority of African countries will be dominated by a vibrant youth population. So why not? We have a youth sounding board or a youth advisory board at the African Union. Secondly, I have to say that, but before we do this, we have to, build or invest in the capacity building and capacity strengthening of young people. Because oftentimes we say include young people, include young people. It's just like how we say include women in leadership and political position. And we don't want to say include feminists women in leadership and political positions, right? Because including women in political position and bringing a feminist woman in political position, they are different things, right? So they are different things. We see how lots of women who has come into political positions uh, for that taking us 30 years back from where we have come from, right? So but this is the same thing about when you include a young person who is uninformed about these issues, they would take us 100 years back. That inclusion does not mean anything. So I am going to speak hugely on investing in youth education and youth empowerment and capacity strengthening. Most of us are hearing about African Commission and African Union for the first time, and we don't even know the difference. Right. Most of us have never heard about what is called a universal periodic review by the UN. We don't, all this human rights mechanism, we don't know about the resolution 275. We don't know about the recent intersex resolution, all of this resolution. We don't even know how to get accredited to be observers at the African Union. So all of this is not just about talking, speaking to these issues on the surface level. How do we begin to mainstream and localize, I hate to say localize, but sorry if I don't mean, localize the knowledge about what is happening? Because most of us focus on national advocacy with our government, but these advocacies would not bear fruit because our government has assented to something else within the um, bigger umbrellas. So we need to also meet them at that position to be able to, um, should I say, speak and also get diplomatic influence on our government. There's a lot of lobbying that goes on within this space. For example, if you are trying to um, push for a, um, a, a view or a policy that protects indigenous rights in your country, and you're looking for how to tap your government to wake up in this to this view that you're pushing. The African Commission or the African Union is a good place. You can find allied countries who are huge and doing well in indigenous rights to be able to tap your government during their negotiation and during their uh, deliberations to say, hey, Nigeria, we got this complaint. You know, we are partners and this is the, what is supposed to happen in your country. Why is this not happening? You use their peers. Countries have peers. You use their peers and their 
allies to hold them accountable to issues, which is why places like um, the Universal Periodic Review is very huge on countries giving recommendations to other countries who are up for review on where they need to invest and where they need to do well as regards human rights. So it is important that we not only fight for inclusion, but we build our capacity as young people to be able to engage in this space and not tokenistic engagement. I mean, actual engagement where we come, we file reports, we write shadow reports, we engage as observers, we get our conclusion, we begin to follow up in country on these conclusions. So it's not just about the surface level engagement to, um, for um, organizations or funders to give you money to go to these spaces and sit down. Some of us end up going there and just gallivanting the whole of <laughs> the whole of the African Union without actually being in any room or speaking or making um, submissions or interventions. So capacity building is important. First of all, to raise awareness on all of these mechanisms and what why they are important in the first place. Then secondly, I would, thirdly, I would like to speak around building movements. So I understand that Africa is a very diverse um, continent and uh, a lot of things, there are more things to take us apart than to bring us together. We have cultural differences, linguistic barrier, um, the passport inequality, like I, I can't go to South Africa. Anytime I get a trip to go to South Africa, my heart starts palpitating because, you know, the whole application, the immigration, you see how all these social justice issues are connected and limiting us from achieving a just and equitable society. We cannot take away the area, the, the conversation around passport inequality in building movements, right? Because if we must build movements, we must come together, both digitally, both in person. And, and there, is the, there is the radicalization that comes from people dreaming together, people being in solidarity with each other. And which is why these oppressive systems and imperialist systems are naturally built to keep people apart, ranging from colonial language, just little West Africa here, we know how the language dynamic is, and some of us have gone to proceed to taking a second language so that we're able to interact with other people, right? So we need to build movement of young people. How are the youths in um, DRC, or how are the youths in South Africa supporting the and championing the causes of young people in DRC? We know what is happening in DRC at the moment. And when I talk about movement building, allow me to talk about it more broadly and not just as regards the um, topic at hand. The movement is important because when we as a people begin to come together, then there is limited, there is um, less time to strategize anew, right? If something is happening in Southern Africa and Nigerian young people or Nigerian societies have experienced such issues before, instead of South Africa starting from afresh to ideate how to um, build strategies around these issues, they could just adopt what happened in Nigeria, take lessons from the best practices and implement. It, it saves them resources, it saves time for planning. Most of us end up drawing roadmap, drawing roadmap, but movement building can help us consolidate, adopt best practices, and then amplify our advocacy ask. Right. Because sometimes, for example, if you're going as, let's say, a youth-led organization working on LGBTQI issues, you might really not make any headway because the people you're representing alone has created the barrier for you to engage in government systems. But imagine that we are coming from an African youth perspective that is inclusive of both LGBTQ persons, youths with disability, youths living with HIV, in that larger umbrella of African youth. You see that our ask is go, it goes directly and there is no blockade, right? So there is more risk when we act alone than when we come together. When we come together, it's, it spreads the risk. It dispels the risk even. So movement building is important. Young people should speak to each other. Young people from Ghana, from South Africa, from Namibia, from DRC should speak to each other. These are not single issues um, problem. They are connected. No matter how you try to differentiate your context, they are all connected to the same actors, to the same oppressors, to the same systems antithetical to the achievement of human rights for all. So we should all come together. So which is why I, I like to talk about interconnectedness of justice, being that the struggle for economic justice is intertwined with the struggle for racial justice, indigenous rights, LGBTQI rights, and the right to access to health. 
So all of these are together. So why not we come together and build a single movement of African youths to be able to speak up on all of these issues. And then lastly, for my points, I just want to say that we need to leverage on, we, we have been called um, um, children of the digital age that we spend our time online and pressing phone. I, I think it's high time we begin to show the world what pressing phone can actually do, like what pressing phone using tablet and using computers can actually do. We need to begin to um, mainstream these issues in the public space. And I think it's high time organizations come together because this African Union reform has been going on since 2017 and it's only coming to limelight since last year for civil societies. It's, so we need to mainstream these issues, get everyone to start talking about it because it affects our, our work. Even if your organization does not necessarily work in the AU, but it trickles down, its impact and effect trickles down to your national or even to your grassroots work. We know some of the successes that has been recorded from the um, African Commission, on, uh, especially around immigration, freedom of association. So we do. We would not want that to be rolled back. We would not want such successes to be rolled back. So it's time we begin to take charge of the digital sphere, the digital ecosystem, to be able to advocate and raise awareness around these issues. Like this teaching we are doing, we have over 52 people on this call, which this would have cost us almost $100,000 to bring 52 people in a space to talk about African, African Union reform. But using leveraging this digital space has opened us up to understanding what is going on, even if we do not have time for more in-depth conversation or in-depth knowledge, but at least you know what is going on, how the um, far right people are infiltrating into the African right system. And not just it's not just our government, there is external influence. The African Union was built to resist colonialism and essentially to decolonize African practices, but the, 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 the otherwise is what we are seeing. We're seeing how white evangelical supremacists are coming to Africa and asserting dominance and strong arming our government and our political leaders with resources, making them to not stick to the agenda of decolonization and to resist colonization. So we see that this is not just our leaders. There is a lot of external influence around um, pushing back on progressive rights within the African continent. So um, I think then again, when we do all of this, then it opens us up to the policy advocacy part. We need to learn how to, as young people, it's still tied to building capacity. We need to learn how to lobby. We need to learn how to speak up. The vibrancy, other groups are engaging in these spaces, but when young people come, there seems to be more disruption. There seems to be more resounding echoes and voices because we not only leverage physical presence or physical engagement, we also make noise in the social media space or in the digital space. So we need to put in ourselves in this policy advocacy conversation. We need to share this reform document with all young people so they can understand, they can read and interpret as to how it affects or impacts them contextually. So I think I just want to round off here to say that um, there's more risk in not acting than the risks in acting, right? So we need to act. We need to um, force ourselves in any way to understand what is going on. Because by the time it happens in African Union, then it begins to happen in ECOWAS, it begins to happen in East African commissions and, and all of those things. We see how it's th this pressures are coming from all around, left, right, and center, and every focus is currently in Africa to see how to undermine progress that has happened or that has been achieved all of these years. We do not even want to begin to talk about that Saudi Arabia has just been appointed chair for the next commission on status of women and in the United Nations. So, <laughs> it's, so it, it feels like a big play, right? So this is what we, don't, we do not want to happen within the African Union. Um, last month or uh, two months ago, Israel just filed um, an application to become an observer at the African Union, right? These are the things that young people are supposed to know and speak up against using digital tools, even if you're, you cannot be there. We have to reject this new colonialism. Why does Israel want to become an observer at African Union, if not to dictate and strong arm governments with money? So we... we
we need to speak up, right? Because this is neocolonialism and this is um, erosion of human rights and all of the achievements Africa has gotten in the last couple of years. So I just want to give a big shout out to uh, the South African Minister of Foreign Affairs. She is so super, she's so good. And I, I feel like I wish we all had leaders who are as outspoken as she is. So thank you so much. I really want to charge all of us today as young people to be concerned about what is happening within the African Union, the African Commission and other regional mechanisms. Because on the long run, that is all we have. There is little to what um, the West can do for us when it comes to our own continent. Because now um, you see all the countries that are passing LGBTQI views saying that or talking about that under the auspices of decolonization, meaning that LGBTQI is a Western importation. So we still do not want to bring in more Western influence to our work. So it's time that we as African young people start understanding and speaking up about these issues in these little ways. You can, a quick Google search can give you a little bit of education about what all of this is. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Justin, for those highlights and for the charge. I feel really pumped. Um, to be honest, I, I am not so knowledgeable around the AU reforms and their work, but these um, conversations, these conversations have really, you know, in, got, gotten me intentional and I am more concerned to want to, you know, learn more. And I like that you highlighted that we really need to build our capacity. A lot of young people keep saying, oh, we're not involved. They don't call us to meetings. They don't invite us to events. They don't invite us to you know, sessions, all those high level sessions. Well, I think the question should be, how informed are you? Would you go there and make a mess of yourself? Would you go there and contribute meaningfully? And it's so interesting that you have highlighted all of these. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Justin, for that. Wow, so it has been an interesting and insightful time already. Um, I think we'll leave the floor open to um, questions, to reflections, to conversations, really. So if you have anything to say or to add, or if you have any questions, please put your hand raised. And I'm sure um, Mubin in the control room would give you the opportunity to speak. Yeah, I can see some comments in the chat box. Okay. Yeah, great points, Justin. Nice one. Solidarity remains the, ch the shortest route. Okay. I think we have some hands up. Aha. Okay. Yes, Samuel. Um, Mobin, can you give... Do you want to speak? He has been given the floor now. Yeah, he can speak. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mobin. Yes, Samuel, the floor is yours. Yes. So thank you so much for uh, giving me this opportunity. Uh, thank you, Rachel, my Justin, and Divine. In fact, it has been so uh, wonderful. Just like uh, Rachel admitted, it's so wonderful to learn, especially around... Um, uh, AU reforms and all that, especially as regards uh, young people, African young people. So I really want to thank you so much, Justin. Justin really um, spoke a lot about what I feel is very paramount and imperative for uh, for AU, um, talking around um, issues around uh, uh, youth advisory committee uh, to the African Union. So I feel that this is not just important, but essential because it's high time um, we begin to get the perspectives of the youth from the young people, from, 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 from youth themselves, and not just somebody somewhere thinking what is right for the youth and not um, giving uh, up the spaces for the youth. You know, uh, Justin jokingly talked about young people coming with their folded chairs. It's beyond that. I think at, with every possible uh, means and uh, ways that young people should uh, insert themselves, because it's obvious in Africa, most times, if uh, most times young things are actually most times fought for uh, with the lessons of um, with the lessons we learned from Senegal election. So it took some sort of um, 
some sort of revolution, be it peaceful revolution, for some voices to be heard. And if that be the need, then I think it's very important that um, we begin to talk about empowering youth voices to understand how important it is that um, young people begin to uh, fold their sleeves and not just sitting back um, desiring to serve the same, um, the same uh, gatekeepers who have kept African young people at the back. So uh, this is very important. And I feel I need to acknowledge Justin and uh, for that very contribution. And I feel it's very necessary. Anything that has to do with the reform should talk about how to get young people involved, not just being involved, but also part of the um, policy makers and decision uh, takers uh, with maybe if it works out, a, 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 a youth advisory committee. So I think uh, that's what I, just what I want to contribute. And uh, thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you so much, Samuel, for your contribution. Thank you so much. Okay, so we have a question in the Q&A box. Um, what entry points can youths and allied CBOs leverage towards joining or being active beyond observer status at both regional and continental mechanisms in Africa? Um, so I think I would like to leave this question to, or Justin, do you want to speak? No, I think May should May is in the first. <laughs> I was <laughs> going to say that. All right, May. Uh, all right, thank you so much. So basically, I think the first thing um, which Justin has highlighted is for us to be informed of what's going on. Um, the second one is for us to kind of gather all efforts and engage. Um, and this is something that we've been we've been doing since June last year as civil society organizations. And here I'll just mention the co-conveners of the AU reforms project, uh, which are uh, Initiative for Strategic Education in Africa, Center for Human Rights, Synergia, as well as um, Institute for for Human Rights and Development in Africa, and we were joined recently by Robert Kennedy Foundation for Human Rights. What we've been trying to do uh, is basically, um, we're trying to create spaces for civil society organizations to engage, um, to be informed of what's happening at the African Union um, at the African Union level, and also providing them with an with avenues of um, kind of highlighting their concerns and the issues that uh, need to be addressed in the upcoming reforms. We've created an AU reforms working group, which all of you are welcome to join. Uh, we're trying to convene civil society organizations um, that work on different aspects of human rights issues, youth-led organizations, organizations that are focused on LGBTIQ plus issues, organizations that are focus on children's rights issues, we are all trying to convene together and, and work towards um, providing the, um, the consultants with civil society organizations position paper um, in which we are presenting the, uh, the demands and asks of the civil society organizations and what we would like to see coming out of the of the um of the AU reforms process because like we've all said before civil society organizations have not been engaged in the process so our voices are lacking in, in and they're not reflecting in the, in the proposals that we are seeing and the proposals that we have discussed um one of the questions that uh, came up to the chat box now is how do we join the working group um Rachel will share with you the email addresses that you can write to indicating your interest in joining the working group and uh, thereafter you will be continuously engaged provided with updates and provided with opportunities to also kind of like tell us as civil society organizations what 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 needs to be you know addressed in the in the African Union reforms we've yeah we've been engaging since um June 2013 yeah June last year uh we've developed a report of activities that we have um done and each one of you who is interested in in, in receiving this report um you're also more than welcome to indicate in the chat box um and then we will share with you and we'll continue the engagement through the working group
through the webinars that we'll be hosting engagement at the African Commission. Um, during the last session, we've held a, a side event where we introduced civil society organizations to the African Union forms, their applications on human rights. Yeah, basically, yeah, we're trying to kind of leverage on whatever avenue that we have available to engage, to discuss, to show our concern. Um, yeah, and this is this is actually one of them. So like I said, if you're interested in joining the working group, please just type on the chat box. Uh, we will share with you all the details that you need. Thank you. Thank you so much, May. Yes, so like me had said, um, if you're interested in joining the AU Reforms Working Group, I like the fact that we are getting intentional right here and now. Um, if you're interested, um, you would send an email to Cynthia at the isla.org. I will copy that and put it in the chat box. And then I'll also like to mention that the Ali, that's the Amazon Leadership Initiative, has a pan-African network of young female leaders. Um, they are building a generation of empowered Black women. So if you're interested in joining the Ali as a young female leader, please send an email to, to info at theali.org. So I'll just quickly put, sorry, I am trying to, okay, yeah, to everyone. So for the AU reforms, if you want to join the AU reforms working group, send an email to Cynthia. And then if you want to join the Ali Pan-African Network of Young Female Leaders, send an email to info at the Ali.org. Thank you so much, Mei. So I can see another hand is raised. Um, let me quickly look at that. Oh, I it's good. It's done. Probably the person's question has been answered. Oh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, it's up again. <laughs> yes, Paul, uh, you have the floor. Mobin, can you? Okay, yeah, you can speak now. Okay, thank you all. Um, Just to add up with what Justin says, um, it's, it's high time young people start taking up this space. Um, and investing on, on ourselves. Most times we don't get to look at the government to invest in us. Most times we can actually do it ourselves and make sure that we um, bring in our ideas to these forums, whereby when we come there to speak, we're not just uh, speaking as, as young people, but showing that we're capable of taking spaces also. So it's, it's also an issue whereby young people just feel like um, these are just, uh, they have to call them to the table where they don't want to strive to get to the table. So for me, I feel like, um, just like Justin said, it's now time for us to start taking our places at the table and not just trying to look for people that would put us there. We need to start telling our issues ourselves. So thank you, Justin. Thank you so much. I was inspired by your conversation, the conversation we had today. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for that contribution. And I can say that every young person, every young African on this call was really inspired by the conversation with the three panelists. So I can see some people putting their emails in the chat box. It may be difficult to track, um, to keep track of all the emails coming in because we have, you know, lots of chats coming in. But please, if you're interested in joining, okay, thank you, Mobin. But if you're interested in joining the AU reforms, send an email to Cynthia. And if you want to join the Pan-African Network of the Ali, send an email to info at um, the Ali.org. Okay, another hand is raised. Um, I don't know, I can't see it from yes, my end. Sarah. You're okay. Sarah. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much for the inspiring section. This has really been an eye opening for me and I know for other participants too, for this um, great um, submission. I must say that um, a very quick one, there's no much to add to what has already been said because I don't want to spoil the fun already. But what I want to say is that um, sometimes too, we young people can intend being um, capacity building lead for other or colleague young people. 
because um, taking, for instance, this great panelist that we have today, listening to you people, I was inspired. And this is a wealth of um, uh, experience and capacity that can be trickled down to other young people who are aspiring to come to these spaces. In as much as we are looking for forward for capacity building opportunity, sometimes when we also happens to get on the decision making table as young people, it is our prerogative interest to ensure that you are not the only person that is on such decision making table, but you also bring or hold hands other young people and bring them to the same table so that we can have a collective voice. Because if you are the only one speaking on the table, your voice may not be stronger. But if there are other young people that through you, they also come to the table, they will support you and together your points and issues can be table well and people will take it serious. So this is just a plea to us all. Africa, our problem is synonymous. We are just the same, the same governance structure, the same problem. So we have to, since we share the same problems, it's important that we have this cross learning an opportunity to build the capacity of other young people. I was really inspired listening to you people and you shouldn't let this uh, capacity and knowledge go. Just keep sharing within your network and within other young people that you can also identify in the continent that are really trying to come up. Let's share the knowledge and build the capacity of other young people and collectively we can support each other to get to where we want to get to. The, the, the space are not going to hand over to us. We need to take it. And the more we build uh, capacity and collaborate together, we can take up those spaces. Just the little I want to share. I don't want to spoil it. You've said it all. Thank you so much for your contribution. Thank you so much, Watara. No, you did not spoil it at all. I like that you highlighted that together we are stronger. We have to build movements and not just any movements. We have to build informed movements, movements of people that are intentional, people who want to, you know, make change, people who want to be at the be at the policy table and make informed decision. Thank you so much. So I don't know if um, our panelists have final words. Uh, Mei, what are your final words? Um, yeah, I'd like, just like to thank uh, the panelists for their great, great submissions. Even myself, I was inspired listening to Divine and Justin. Um, thank you all to the participants for their active engagement and for tuning in to the conversation, which is a very important conversation. And I think the last thing that I would like to kind of reiterate from Justin's point and from Divine's as well, is that it is very important and crucial for us as civil society organizations to engage because this reforms process uh, provides an opportunity for us to be part of building the system that will shape the future of Africa. Um, it's an opportunity for us to engage and participate in setting the priorities, the values and the mechanisms that I would like to see on the continent. We were not part of the system when it was established. So it will be a little bit challenging for us to engage with the limited tools and the limited avenues, but we must make uh, the best use of the current reforms process because through it, we can push for our own agenda, for our own objectives and what we would like to see um, in Africa, the Africa that we want really as youth. Um, the second thing is that uh, we need to engage to defend the African human rights mechanisms because like Justin said, what is happening is actually scary. Um, the limitations, the closing of spaces for civil society organizations and activists to engage. Uh, it's quite concerning. We need to engage. Uh, we need to be vigilant of what's happening on the continent, especially within the within the context that we have uh, where um, policy organs at the African Union are interfering with the independence of the um, of the human rights mechanisms on the continent. An example of this is their interference in the independence of the African Commission, which resulted in the adoption of Resolution 1015. Um, there's also the fact that we keep having incompetent um, members of African human rights bodies. So as civil society organizations and youth groups, we need to engage in the nomination and selection or election process of these members because they are the ones who are sitting, they're the ones who are de determining and they're the ones who are dealing with the human rights issues on the continent. Um, and just like uh, Justin has said, we need to be 
uh, we need to be careful of the rise of the anti-actors, anti-right actors on the continent. Um, one of the recent examples is that uh, um, Alliance Defending Freedom, it's a, an American-based religious uh, organization, kind of um, submitted the proposal for, for it to be granted an observer status at the African Commission latest session, the 77th ordinary session. So they're active and they're trying to um, they're trying to kind of engage in our spaces with their own agenda. As civil society organizations, we need to be mindful of this, of what's happening. Um, and we need to continue engagement. We need to make sure that our voices are out there and that we are heard. Um, I think I'll close with this. It's concerning, but I think I'll close at this point. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, May, for those final comments. Yes, Divine, final words from you. Well, Rachel, it's very hard to put the icing to the cake when the cake already looks this fulfilling. Um, so all that I will really have to say is let's not neglect capacity building. I think Justin already highlighted it so well. And also let's not neglect our CSOs, our civil society organizations. And I'm, I'm just going to quickly bring up um, what we do in the alley, um, seeing that I am touching on that right now. So the reason why CSOs are um, significant um, organizations such as the Amazon Leadership Initiative is because we do encourage capacity building. See, for instance, we focus on women empowerment and um, equipping women in leadership roles. And it's not just about receiving, receiving knowledge, sitting down, listening, but actually having the tool and using it in actual situations so that when you enter spaces such as um, AU organs, you know exactly what to do. You're not lost. It doesn't seem like it's the first time that you are exposed to such things. Um, so we have a network of over 3,000 uh, young girls from across Africa, and we have different caucus groups from the Southern Africa, Western, Northern, et cetera. And um, this actually happens to be one of my favorite programs in the alley, which is the annual leadership forum. And what happens there is now we put the young female leaders in the midst of female luminaries who are already doing the breaking of barriers and obstacles that are stopping young people from entering into the significant leadership roles and having a say. So we're putting them in, in one room with these young female leaders who have questions with regards to, okay, how do I enter the space? What can I do to be confident? What can I, um, how do I lobby? How do I engage? Um, like with this intergenerational exchange, how do we go about doing that in a way that is respectful, but in a way that is also assertive? So you see that those spaces really um, allow for young people to equip themselves. This is particularly focused on women. Um, I'm, I'm even proud to say that, you know, in the past years of our leadership forums, we've had the privilege of having um, speakers such as the United Nations Deputy Secretary um, General, uh, Her Excellency Amina J. Mohammed. We even had um, the youngest Namibian minister, um, Her Excellency Emma Theophilus, who was there. So it's, it's, it's really groups like the civil society organizations like this that really boost your confidence to see that these things that we are discussing they're not impossible it's not far-fetched it's not something that we study at school and we only get there in our 50s no it's possible to really uh, penetrate these spaces as young as we are and as um, as urgent as right now so that's all that I'll really have to say thank you so much Rachel thank you divine for those final words Yes, Justine, final comments from you. My final comment is no comment. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so I, I just want to say that I just want to say that build your capacity. No one is coming to save us. No one is coming to save you. And uh, I I currently go with what Watara said. I think I remember it's Watara who says, if you're a young person, and even if it's this little that you know, please trickle it down, let it trickle down to other young people within your network. That is the only way we can sustain um, this knowledge, that we can sustain the momentum by everyone knowing. Because if you want to be the poster child of youth, you cannot, you would get tired at some point, you would burn out at some point. I tell people, in, especially within the activism space, do not let yourself become a poster child for anything. Because if you're a youth poster child and 
um, you get over 30 five you're going to be dumped by the system that has been using you as a poster so it's important that it is everyone who is involved in doing it don't be that lgbtqi herculean activist or activist of hegemony don't be that women's rights activist be an activist in your own right in your own space bring up other people impacting other people's lives so that through you as well they're able to contribute their voices because if you keep talking you lose your voice alone so I just want us to, in the spirit of building movement and collectivism, let's all come together and support one another and then be concerned about what is happening because truly it's going to affect our work. So thank you so much, everyone, for listening. Thank you so much, Justin. Thank you, Mei and Divine. Um, it's so hard that we'd have to bring this conversation, I mean, this insightful conversation to an end. But before I give the closing remarks, I would like us to you know, take some shirts. We have to take some shirts. We have to keep memories of this moment. So I would like all of us to, I mean, if you can, I like your pose, Justin. <laughs> so if you can, please turn on your cameras and I'm sure Mubin is there to help us with the screenshots. So I think we will, you know. <laughs> Please, I'll be in your DM to collect them. Yes, so please turn on your cameras. Give your favorite smile. If you can bring out your entire teeth like myself, please do that. And um, yeah, Mubin, over to you. Okay, just pause and hold. Okay. Got it. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you, everyone. Yes, so I would like to express a huge thank you to our esteemed panelists for their insightful comments for the discussion. It was really engaging and enlightening. I'd also like to extend my gratitude to the organizers and to the conveners of this webinar, to ISLA, to Center for Human Rights, to CHEV, to Institute for Human Rights and Democrat Democratization in Africa, Seniger and Robert F. Kennedy Foundation, and of course, to the Amazon Leadership Initiative for putting resources together in bringing this event to fusion. And yet to all participants, to young Africans who have joined us today, thank you so much for your enthusiasm, thank you for engaging, the comments, the emojis, the highlights. Thank you so much for being an amazing audience. And yes, as we wrap up, I want us to, you know, hold on to what we've learned today. Don't forget them. Step down this training, continue to get informed, keep, keep being concerned and stay intentional. Thank you so much. Until I see you next time, I would wish you all the best in your endeavors. Bye from here. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Rachel, lovely host. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you so Bye. much, Rachel. You did amazing well. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, May.